Hello everybody and welcome to this my first of two first of two videos on the Konica Auto Reflex T3. It's been a long time since I first got a request for this and I finally was able to make this video. So the Konica T3 is an interchangeable lens SLR and that simply means that the lens can be taken off and put back onto it. Uh, at any time when a photo isn't being taken without impairing the film or images on it. It has a center weighted light meter and what that means is that the light meter will read the scene coming into the lens and that an area about the size of my bo uh, the, the box I'm making with my fingers right here will govern the majority of the meter input. So a standard averaging meter would look at this whole scene and figure out what exposure was needed to make it basically gray. So center weighted biases the weighting of the meter reading to the center of the frame. It's either 60-40 or 70-30 or something like that. I couldn't find the exact split um, with it, but basically what that means is that what's in the center of your frame will be more likely to be properly exposed than what's around it. The viewfinder magnification on it right here is 0.78x, meaning that what's in your viewfinder is going to be 78% of the size of what's gonna reach the film. And the frame coverage is 92%, meaning that if what you're seeing right now is what would be on your film, then you would lose about 4% top and bottom and each side in your viewfinder. So there's a little bit more image that's gonna be on your film than what you're gonna see in your viewfinder. The focusing screen is a fixed matte screen with a central prism and center weighted indicator ring. So if you look through your, um, your prism right now, that little ring in the center, which is about this big, is what is that, that outer ring is the um, center weighted area. So that's, the major that's where the majority of the metering is coming from. And then the flash sync on this speed is 1 1 25th of a second, which was pretty fast for its day. The Konica T3 was marketed as a professional SLR. It is very well made and exceedingly durable, and many users of these cameras indicate that they've never had to have service for them, even with more than 30 years of fairly heavy use. These are robust cameras. They feel like it too. Um, they're incredibly heavy, but they are well made and uh, should continue lasting for as long as they're well cared for. Konica claimed, now I can't verify that this is correct. I cannot verify if the claim is correct. Uh, I, I do know that Konica claimed this, that this was the first professional level SLR with automatic exposure control. You know, um, not 100% certain I buy that, but I, I could, it's a distinct possibility I'm wrong. Um, at any rate, in 1973, the Minolta XK was already on the market and it had automatic exposure compensation, but not built into the camera. Instead, it had it through one of its prisms. So it is a distinct possibility that this was the first professional grade camera with automatic exposure control built into the camera. This was made by Konishi Roku Company. I apologize to all of my Japanese viewers for completely destroying that name. Uh, it was made in Japan from 1973 until 1975, so a pretty short run on the T3. It was preceded by the Auto Reflex T2, and concurrent with the Auto S3, A1000, and A3, and it was followed by the T3N. So that's why this only had a two-year production run, because after it, we had the, T the T3N. So as we do, let's go around the camera and see what all of the different things on it are. And technically on the front of the camera, we'll start here with the strap lugs. This is where you would connect your strap so that you can have it around your neck or wrist. Now here, here on the top of the camera, we have the film rewind knob and lever and the lever pops out to allow you to rewind the film and the knob is well, it doesn't do anything because you don't need to lift it up on this camera. Model designation, film plane indicator, prism housing, shutter speed dial right here. Uh, then you have 
your ASA, which is the exact same thing as ISO. It's now called ISO, but the numbers are the same, and DIN dial. And if you lift it to rotate it, that you just set your film speed in those windows by lifting and rotating. And 400 ISO is the same as 27 DIN. You have your multiple exposure lever right here, film advance lever, on off switch. This is basically just, uh, come on. There we go, that's off and locked. Battery check, if you pull it all the way back to the um, shutter dial, and then we have it on over here. Frame count window and film advance lever. And then that little black line right there is your shutter speed index, which will tell you which shutter speed you're set to. On the front of the camera, we have here the DOF preview button and self timer switch. They're built into one. So if you push it in this way, you get depth of field preview. If you rotate it out the other way, you now have a self timer. And as you might have heard, the mirror just popped up so that you don't get mirror shake with, associated with your image when the self timer finishes counting down. So that's a nice feature. Then we have the, le the lens mount, which you just saw right here. Lens mounting index, we'll see how to use that in the second video, and the lens release button right there. On this side, we have the flash PC sockets, M and X. M is for bulbs, they're not really made anymore, they're pretty obsolete, you have to have a special flash form, you're not likely ever to use that. X stands for xenon, which is also the modern type of flash, so any flash you could buy online, or even Vivitar is going back to this to the 80s, will be an X flash. It's the standard type of strobe you've probably seen before. This is the film back release lever right here that you use to open up the film back. Fortunately, there's no film in this camera. If we go to the back of the camera, it's pretty simple. We have the viewfinder right here and the film memo holder. So when you get your box of film, you tear the tab off, and you slide it in there to remember what type of film you have. On the bottom of the camera, we have some important information about the batteries, which does not make any sense to me, and we'll get to why that is in just a minute. Film rewind button, tripod bushing, battery chamber. There's also a guide for how to use your battery check here, which is to remove the lens, set the ISO to 100, the shutter speed to 1 1 25th, and to check the battery. Um, and then um, if the light meter needle lines up properly with the little battery check notch in the viewfinder. When you do that, then you know your battery is good. You don't have to do that right after you, I mean, you should probably do that right after you put a battery in, but you can also do that at any time to make sure your battery still has life in it. If we go inside of the camera, we have is the film cassette chamber right there. Then we have the forks for the film rewind right here film guide rails, so these silver rails are what are, help keep the, guide, the film moving through the camera and flat. The top and bottom prevent the film from moving up and down, and then these inner ones sandwich the film against the pressure plate here to keep it flat. Film tension sprocket, as film sits inside of a cassette for however long, it develops a memory, and that memory wants to pull the film back into the cassette as it's traveling, so the film tension sprocket here prevents that from happening. Film take up spool. And then this little spring here rests against the film cassette to keep the film coming out at proper alignment. This doesn't move at all, this moves forward only, as you can see there, until you hit the film rewind button and now this spins freely. So if you don't hold the film rewind button down when you rewind the film, you will break either your film or your camera. This also has a very nice film take-up spool right here. You can see there's an inner slot there. And we'll see a little bit better how this works in the second video, but if you put your film in and advance it, there's a second inner part moving that sandwiches it and makes it almost impossible not to load this film correctly on the first try. It's a, a genius mechanism. I'm not sure why, honestly, it's not in every camera ever made. It's really well done. 
some notes on this camera. It has a completely mechanical shutter. The battery is only there to operate the light meter. There are two versions of the T3. I don't recall, I don't think the T3N is designated as such, but the T3N adds a fixed hot shoe up here on top of the camera. Also adds a viewfinder shutter, which allows you to block out the viewfinder um, so for long exposures and has a split prism focusing screen on some of the models. The T3N is a separate model uh, that is different from the earlier T3 that's shown in this video, but like I said, I don't know if it's designated as the N or not. Third-party lenses can be problematic on these cameras, and sometimes if you use a third-party lens and you advance the film, when you finish advancing the film, the shutter will refire again, as well as when you initially tripped the, um, the shutter release. So um, I don't know why that is. I don't know if that was something that was built into these cameras intentionally or, or what. But at any rate, with the, the T3 at least, um, it's better to try to stay with the Konica lenses rather than going off brand and getting a third party. Some things not to do with your camera. Don't touch the shutter. Uh, I know it sounds like fun to put your finger in and then let it close on your finger. That's going to ruin your shutter. Also, if you touch your shutter, the, the oils on your fingers can cause it over time to not work properly or to have the timing be off. When you're done with your camera for the day, always discharge the shutter. Make sure that you discharge the shutter before you lock it and store it for the night because there, it's a mechanical shutter. There are springs in there that are under tension as soon as you wind it. And if you store it with that tension on for a long enough time, the, the springs will lose their springiness and then your shutter won't be accurate anymore. Don't touch the mirror that's in there because your finger oils can tarnish it or desilver it and cause your light meter reading to be off and your focusing to be more of a challenge. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car because heat damage can cause the lubricating oils in the lens to have the aperture, to, to reach the aperture and then it won't work properly. It can also cause oils in the camera to get to places they shouldn't and then they, when they get back to their normal viscosity, it can muck up the operation of your camera. Also with cold, in the very in extreme cold, the oils in your camera and lens will break down and become really gummy and then your, your camera won't operate properly. Also, leaving your camera in your car is a really great way, no matter how long you're out of your car, to come back to a broken window and no camera. Camera thieves aren't discerning. They just want to grab something and go. Don't store your camera or lenses in a plastic bag or box unless you have a desiccant pack, a fresh and charged desiccant pack with it because fungus can grow on the lenses and in the leather of the camera as well as in the optical system of the, the prism. And uh, that's always a mess and hard to deal with. And don't let this camera get wet. Even though it's mechanical and, and not electronic, water getting into the system could cause components to rust. And just remember your Konica Auto Reflex T3 is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So this was the first video on the Konica T3 where we looked at what the different things are. In the second video, we'll talk about how to use all of them. So if this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track and that I'm producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have questions or comments, please leave those below. I'm more than happy to respond to those. I check every day or two to see what new comments there are on the channel. If you have suggestions or ideas for future videos, please let me know. And that will, um, if I have the equipment and the technical know-how, I'm more than happy to make those. If you're an amateur photographer who has taken photos with an Auto Reflex T3, comments are below. Feel free to share a link to your work. And one last thing, thank you everyone very much for watching and I'll see you in part two.